Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings from Team Asian Confluence. We extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished panelists and guests for today's Nadi Conversations webinar entitled Conservation of Animal Corridors and Infrastructural Development, Can They Be Balanced and Overview? Asian Confluence is a think tank institution headquartered in Shillong, Meghalaya in the Northeast India that works through research, training, advocacy and exchange programs towards creating better understanding of the East and South Asian region in the larger framework of the Indo-Pacific region as a confluence of ideas and geographies. Our vision is for a stable and prosperous Asia where ecology is honored, diversity is celebrated, prosperity is shared, sovereignty is respected and boundaries become connectors. Nadi Conversations is our ongoing initiative which includes a series of webinars at, and lectures on the common theme to highlight the narrative of a celebration of the common riverine and civilizational heritage of the nations and the people in the Ganga, Brahmaputra, Meghna Basin. Wildlife corridors have been used by various species to migrate, breed and feed since ages. These are increasingly becoming relevant as essential tools for wildlife conservation. The mapping of them in the past few years have been done to understand the pattern and area of passage from which they pass so that they can be protected for their safety. However, relentless development and degradation has led to division of the habitat, thereby affecting the corridors and the biodiversity of the region. The rapid increase in the industrial and infrastructural development, especially around forests, has resulted in a widespread habitat fragmentation and isolation. And added to this is the growing development around the protected areas and the altered boundaries for having worsened the situation. Our distinguished guests for this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, are Dr. Sandeep Tiwari from the Wildlife Trust of India, and Mr. Shumitra Das Gupta from the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Dr. Sandeep Kumar Tiwari is a wildlife biologist and a conservationist working on wildlife research and conservation for over 25 years. He is the deputy director of the WTI and currently works as a program manager at the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the Species Survival Commission for Asian Elephant Specialist Group. He has headed the team for ground truthing and securing the elephant corridors all over India for 16 years. His areas include mapping of wildlife corridors human elephant conflict mitigation, wildlife policy, linear infrastructure, and habitat restoration. Along with that, he is also the member of the IUCN's SSC uh, World Commission on Protected Areas, the IUCN WCPA Connectivity Conservation Network, the Protected Landscape Seascapes Network, the SSC Biodiversity, and the Protected Areas Network. Welcome, sir. Mr. Shumitra Das Gupto formerly, uh, formerly was the officer in the West Bengal cadre and is currently serving as the additional director general of wildlife in the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India. He has also held the post of the additional chief conservator of forest in West Bengal and the inspector general of forest and wildlife government of India. With more than 32 years of experience as a forester and wildlife manager in government of India, Mr. Das Gupta has proven to be an outstanding proficiency in policy related matters relating to forest, wildlife, biodiversity, conservation in the country, along with excellent leadership and managerial skills. His areas of expertise are forest and wildlife management, international conventions related to wildlife conservation, protected areas management, which includes tiger reserves, wildlife conservation policy, and laws. 
Today, our Executive Director, Mr. Sabisachi Datta, would be joining us this afternoon as the moderator for this webinar. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. and a warm welcome to uh, Mr. Das Gupta from the Ministry of uh, uh, Forests and uh, um, Dr. Tiwari uh, for this conversation. Um, thank you for sparing your time. Uh, we felt that uh, this was a, a conversation which was very timely in the context of uh, what's happening, the focus on, on the development of India, especially with our immediate neighbors. Uh, in the eastern uh, uh, South Asian region. Uh, being Asian Confluence, we are headquartered in, uh, in uh, Shillong in the northeastern region. And as you know that uh, we have, uh, in the northeastern region has borders with uh, many of our neighboring countries, uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal. Um, uh, Mr. Das Gupta has served in Baksa Tiger Reserve, I see, and I have had the opportunity to uh, spend uh, quite some time there. And I was just talking to Dr. Tiwari about his work in the Garo Hills. So uh, on that note, uh, maybe I can open this discussion with a question to both of you. Um, it is that um, as, as activists, as policymakers, um, where do you see the balance of uh, um, uh, the wildlife protection at our border regions? Uh, when we, especially when we have transboundary borders, uh, two nations, vis-a-vis um, -vis the focus on uh, creating, uh, uh, you know, more border infrastructure, more trade, uh, more uh, amount of uh, developmental, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure at the borders. A lot of bridges are coming up, a lot of roads are coming up. We are talking about border economic zones. Um, there's a lot of talk about inland waterways, uh, transboundary develop, being developed. Uh, so uh, again, in, in the backdrop of that, where do you see uh, conservation of, uh, of, of biodiversity and especially the animal corridors, which have naturally been there for centuries um, coming up? So I'd like to maybe start with uh, Mr. Das Gupta, your views, um, both from your experience uh, in the past and as you see it in your current um, current uh, work in the ministry. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, some background noise, sir, but uh, I think if that's okay. Yeah, I have some officers in my sitting area. So I've told them that I will be away yeah, for about 20, 20 minutes, okay? okay? So I thank you for having me in the show. And uh, I also see uh, my good friend Sandeep Kumar Tiwari also there. And uh, yes, this is a very important uh, subject that uh, you have flagged today for discussion. And uh, I would like to, you know, to start uh, the subject. Uh, it, it's a very contentious issue that we discuss these days, uh, development uh, versus conservation. But uh, before I uh, start speaking, uh, you know, in an elaborate manner, I would just like to flag a few figures uh, which I could collect, and I thought that I would be uh, sharing uh, during this uh, program. Uh, this is a figure which uh, uh, differentiates today uh, by about 50 years, that is uh, 70s or early 70s. Uh, the population, the human population, if you see, it was uh, around 54 crore, and now it has gone up to 139 crore. Uh, the GDP, uh, which at that point of time, uh, comparative, it was only 1.64%. And now, in spite of the COVID situation, just before the COVID situation, the GDP was around 4.2%. Uh, the total road length in the country was uh, in the uh, early 70s is what it was around 90,000 running uh, kilometer. And now uh, the last uh, figure that we could uh, find it's uh, nearly 50 lakh kilometer running kilometer. The length of national highways have also you know increased six times from 20 
odd uh, thousand kilometer to uh, 120 uh, thousand kilometer. The per capita income, which was around 7,500, has also increased substantially uh, uh, by rather two rupees 92,000 crores. And we also know some of the earlier we used to know uh, only you know four mega cities as metros. Mumbai, Kolkata, Delhi, and Chennai. But now uh, you have to count so many other cities along with these four metros like Bangalore, Ahmedabad, Pune, Hyderabad, you name, you will have a number of such cities. So this is a, a scenario which uh, certainly speaks of development which is happening and at a great pace for the last 50 years. And, and it has continued to happen. And perhaps uh, the intensity uh, or the momentum it has gathered uh, has increased tremendously in the recent past. Now, when we compare with these hard facts of uh, the development that has happened in the 50 years, now when we compare with the situation of forest, then we will see the forest cover, which was about 19.52% of the geographical area of the country, has also increased, uh, you know, in spite of this kind of development that has taken place to 21.67% when it was last recorded. That is the forest cover I'm talking about. Now, if you see uh, the oasis of uh, the wildlife conservation, the centers of wildlife conservation, uh, the protected areas, uh, you know, it was only 65 in the 70s. Now it has increased to 900 plus. And uh, one more thing that has also happened with the active judiciary uh, in place is that a uh, system called eco-sensitive zone has also uh, been notified. Each uh, national park and sanctuary is now having uh, a periphery, a belt, a buffer, which actually expands the real area of protection by uh, at least by 3%. And uh, such, you know, uh, ESZ has been notified, finally notified for more, more than 400 such national park and sanctuaries. Now, all this has happened, as I was saying, with the uh, growth that has taken place in the country. And, uh, you know, uh, you will also appreciate the fact that uh, the Wildlife Act came into being in 1970 only. Before that, the situation was free for all. Now, in spite of this population pressure, in spite of the development that has taken place, the, uh, the population here in India, due to their very nature, their, uh, their uh, liking for the uh, wildlife or biodiversity, the constitution, all has given support for the development of the forests and the protected areas in the country. Now, if you go by the uh, keystone species, uh, you know, for tiger, elephant, one, one horn, rhinoceros, and lion, if you compare, you will see substantial rise in numbers. And uh, the case of uh, tiger, which was hardly in some 200 in 1970, has gone up to nearly uh, 3,000. And the elephant, uh, which was counted as 50,000, 15,000 in 1985, has now simply doubled to 30,000. And the similar is the case for one hunt, uh, rhinoceros as well as lion. So, you know, uh, with this development, the uh, the species and the habitat of these species has also increased uh, substantially. Uh, and, uh, you know, for the past few years, uh, we are also uh, aware of the fact because we practice and uh, bring about the changes in the policy or new policies. We are now uh, making the policies which are inclusive in nature. And... Uh, we now, the government now believes that conservation of biodiversity cannot be done in isolation. They have to be done with participation. So therefore we exhort all section of the society to be involved in the conservation process. We encourage people who actually lives in the vicinity, the villages, the communities who live in the vicinity of the forest and protected areas uh, to be equal stakeholders. We also promote that urban uh, you know, urbanites, so-called urbanites, of the civil society organization have also got a very important role to play for the biodiversity conservation. So whatever uh, proposals or policies that we make now uh, entails, uh, you know, the inclusiveness of all these sections of the society uh, when we prepare such kind of projects. 
Now, every government schemes, I can name a few which has been recently launched. One is the uh, marine uh, conservation, the turtle conservation uh, plan that we have released, the marine stranding plan that we have released. We have uh, ensured that a component for the communities is there, a very big component for the communities for providing their livelihood, for providing their inputs and in fact you know it's a consultative process that will take place for implementation of these two marine guidelines and action plan that we have uh, released we also you know are fully uh, aware of the fact that employment generation is a very important aspect for the forest dependent communities and uh, likewise we ensure that all these plan policy scheme does have this uh, employment opportunities for the locals, at least the educated local youths who are living in these forest areas uh, or in the vicinity of the protected area. Now, while doing that, uh, you know, we also, uh, you know, there are, as we have said, that uh, the number of protected areas have increased tremendously. And uh, in order to ensure or to measure the efficacy of this uh, protected area. We have also unleashed a very international standard, global standard management effectiveness evaluation system in place, which actually helps us in determining the roadmap for the health, the actions, or the justifications of the PA for the future. And this is actually uh, enabling us in making a number of policy decisions for the uh, protected area management. And uh, you may also appreciate the fact that the ministry has also embarked upon a system called the ecosystem services evaluation because it is not very really easy to make people understand. So why shall I save a tiger? Why shall I save a lion or for that matter, Asiatic elephant? Because the very question comes apart from the beauty and, uh, and aesthetics, what else it does? So, you know, therein comes the uh, ecosystem services that all these animals the habitat provides so this is uh, also a process that we have embarked upon and we are actually have done it in a full scale manner in the tiger reserves now we are taking it up in the national park and sanctuaries as well now this will also help us you know to understand to give people the policy makers more uh, thought processes you know to enable uh, enable their thought process build up their thought process as to why they should be conserving the protected areas and even the corridors that we are going to discuss today. Now, as far as the subject is concerned, you know, the animal corridors and the development that have been given to me, and, uh, I can say for sure because I had an opportunity for serving in West Bengal for a pretty long time in uh, districts like Midnapur, in uh, districts like South Mantipur Parganas, and Jalpaiguri in the north, that there are, uh, you know, beaten tracks which are used, especially by my experience, what I've seen is the elephants. And uh, these are the so-called corridors that uh, we have identified, both in case of tiger as well as uh, elephant, Asiatic elephants. But I can tell you one thing that although we have identified, it should, it's not sacrosanct as per se. You know, the, uh, the corridors or the tracks, the beaten track keeps changing. That's what I've seen in, uh, at least in Medinapur, I've seen for sure. What uh, corridor the elephants used to follow 30 years back is not the place that they are following now. And we also know that large animals like elephant, which moves in group, and they are very habit of long ranging, moving from one place to another. It's also one of the reason for which they keep on moving from one forest to another. Although, you know, uh, uh, degradation of forest is a cause, but I think the most important reason behind is the very nature of the elephant to move together and to move from one place to another in search of their food and uh, you know tigers also are performing their biological you know completing their biological functioning they have also got to move from one place to another and uh, we have also uh, identified uh, tiger corridors in the entire country and that the national tiger conservation authority has already done and i understand that they have also uploaded this in the uh, ntc national tiger conservation authority uh, website so these are the two the corridor system that uh, we have acknowledged and uh, we know that they exist and these are being used, although these are changeable, but these are being used generally by uh, the large group of animals like elephant as well as tigers. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the elephant corridors uh, are not as a part of a legal entity. Uh, 
uh, unlike the tiger. Tiger corridors have been spelled out in clear terms in the Wildlife Protection Act, but this has not been done so in uh, either of neither of the acts. So that is an important issue, but we have to keep in mind that uh, these are the areas, uh, these are a very large chunk of area, uh, which are important for the animal uh, to move, the elephants to move. And it is important, we believe, that uh, to secure the corridors, uh, you know, so that the conflict which actually happens on the ground is under control. Now, uh, we, uh, you may also be aware of the fact that we have a National Wildlife Action Plan uh, which actually lays down the roadmap for conservation of biodiversity for that matter, uh, the wildlife of the country. And uh, the last one for 15 years was released in 2017. And some very new uh, ingredients were made a part of the National Wildlife Action Plan. One of the most important uh, you know, ingredient which was included in the National Wildlife Action Plan is the landscape-based management. And we believe that we have to move away from the conventional method of uh, preparing management plan, executing management plan, protected area-wise, towards the landscape-based, which will obviously include uh, corridors and other areas where animals do move, because it's very difficult, because uh, animals do not actually uh, identify you know, the boundary, the forest boundary, the protected area boundary or for that matter, even international boundary. And they move from one place to another, from one state to another, from one country to another without a passport or a visa. So naturally, we need to identify this and we need to prepare our landscape-based plan. And let me tell you uh, that uh, the ministry is fully aware of this situation. And uh, we have, again, embarked upon uh, a very new concept that we would like to implement on ground and that is the transboundary protected area. And this is an important futuristic uh, issue that we are taking up very seriously. And in the meanwhile, we have already drawn up memorandum of understanding with uh, countries like Nepal, uh, Bhutan. We have already have a memorandum of understanding with Myanmar and with Bangladesh for elephant matters. So when uh, all these MOUs are signed, uh, the two have already been signed, Burma and uh, uh, Bangladesh. But when uh, the uh, Nepal and uh, Bhutan will be signed, then the issue, the transboundary issues of movement of animals will be also sorted out. And we are also looking beyond the scopes of transboundary issues, uh, means the movement of animals. Uh, we are also thinking of joint management uh, plans, management plans for the countries, uh, you know, between India, Bangladesh, India, Bhutan, India, Nepal. So these are all in the, in, in, in the plate uh, that is awaiting us. And in the very near future, we will be able to sort out, you know, many such issues which are actually uh, are coming to us as a teething problem. Now, uh, another thing that I would like to make that, you know, this uh, animals, especially the, uh, the elephant, uh, with the increase in numbers, with the uh, degradation of the so-called forest and the very nature of the elephants from moving from one place to another, they come in conflict. And this conflict has gradually shown an upward rise. And to me, I feel this conflict is not going to be contained very easily. And perhaps the conflict is going to continue in the future as well. So we need to have, uh, you know, we can't have a panacea. And we need to have a process uh, which will be addressing these issues, you know, uh, location-wise. And accordingly, the ministry, uh, you know, periodically are also issuing advisories uh, to the state government as to how to deal with it. And uh, we have also, just for your information, I would say that uh, crop damage is one of the major issues which results in the human elephant conflict. And uh, uh, it's a very important aspect. And uh, the Pradhan Mantri Gramin Fasal Bhima Yojana has recently been included as an add-on policy for uh, elephant, you know, for crop damage in the states. So that's going to help the state uh, in a large manner for containing the human wildlife conflict, which is arising out of uh, the crop damage. Now, we are also going to take up, uh, we must have heard about the CAMPA fund. And we are also going to take up large scale augmentation of fuel and fodder uh, within the forest in order to enrich uh, the forestry situation so that the elephants and the other animals can be 
uh, kept inside the forest. They also increased the compensation package uh, for uh, the uh, the uh, you know the uh, human wildlife conflict that has been done in 2018. We are also thinking of uh, enhancing uh, such kind of uh, package in the future. But in spite of all this, we are aware of the fact that the conflict uh, is becoming very acute in case of elephants. And uh, I'm sure that you are knowing that, uh, you know, uh, there are about 100, uh, if you go by the average of the last 10 years, there will be about 100 uh, elephants uh, which die every year out of such kind of conflict, maybe due to the train hit, maybe uh, the sagging of electric line. Uh, many, very few cases, there may be cases of retaliatory killing. But at the same point of time, we have also noticed that uh, about 500 human beings are also dying every day, uh, every year for uh, the elephants. So it's an alarming situation and uh, we need to actually uh, look into it more seriously uh, in order to find a solution to it. Although solution uh, appears to be, uh, you know, very, uh, what should I say, uh, very critical. Uh, but but in spite of that, we have to keep trying so that the uh, the conflict level can be brought down and some sort of mitigation measures are put in place. So one of the most important thing that I wanted to flag today for uh, today's discussion was uh, the uh, linear infrastructure policy. You know, all said and done, uh, we need to, the country is growing and we need to have the development also in place. So uh, the ministry uh, actually uh, had launched uh, eco-friendly measures to mitigate uh, impacts of linear infrastructure of wildlife and they released it uh, in the year uh, 2017 or 18, 17, 18 for that matter. And this was done with a purpose to help in better designing of uh, linear infrastructure uh, in the country. And that would not only help the safe passage of wildlife, but also uh, you know, will be a step ahead towards the green development, which we uh, speak about nowadays. Now, accordingly, you know, all the uh, the so-called clearances that are provided by the ministry, especially from the wildlife side, we ensure that the animal passage plan are in place. This is for the terrestrial species. For birds, we are also ensuring that bird reflectors are in place. We have also uh, requested and also getting done undergrounding of certain level of uh, cables uh, so that uh, you know the the uh, transmission line does not become a cause of uh, damage for the wild animals. Now, initially, there were a lot of uh, should I say reluctance in the acceptance of uh, such a plan because this plans obviously uh, developing the uh, underpasses, overpasses. Uh, entails a lot of exp expenditure and it's not very easy for say a 100 crore project uh, to be enhanced to 150 crore due to the animal passage plan. But I can assure you uh, with the interventions of the pre present dispensation, it has now become a more or less a system that everybody has accepted that animal passage plan, bird reflectors, undergrounding of cables uh, will be accepted by all and sundry. I'm just giving an example, a few examples that have been set uh, or that have been allowed to be done in the past, in the recent two, three years, was, uh, you know, the implementation, one of them was in the implementation of the world's longest and India's first dedicated underpass for wildlife in National Highway uh, number 7, you know, which passes through Kanha Bench Corridor. And uh, this particular, you know, the underpass has shown pictures 468 pictures of 15 species during the 90 days of study, which was conducted by Wildlife Institute of India for monitoring of animal movement, including tiger. And similarly, uh, construction of underpass uh, of, of a length of 3.94 kilometer for safe passage of wild animals in upcoming road project under the Bharat Mala Pariyojana, passing through the EZ of Ranthambo Tiger Reserve have also been approved. And uh, recently, uh, you will be astonished, you know, this is a, one of the most important thing and we are very happy to uh, tell all and, uh, and sundry that a construction of 4.5 kilometer tunnel passing through the Mukundra Tiger, uh, Hill Tiger Reserve has also been approved and accepted by the uh, National Highway Authority of India. And uh, similarly, uh, you know, Delhi, Saranpur, Dehradun Economic Corridor also aims, which actually aims to reduce the travel time between Delhi and Dehradun. Uh, by substantial uh, by a substantial number of hours as also proposed for underpasses and overbridges 
and uh, the entire 20 kilometer stretch which passes through the reserve forest area 12 kilometer will be uh, as an elevated wildlife corridor so these are all happening and uh, we can tell you for sure that uh, you know uh, india does believe in conservation of wildlife and uh, especially the migratory species and you may recall during the last year we actually held the conference of party for the uh, convention on migratory species and number of issues were discussed and india's uh, you know species conservation efforts were all appreciated but the most important thing that uh, came out of that meeting was the linear infrastructure policy that india has started practicing and now it has been uh, show being shown as an example to the international community especially to the developing countries like india where development as well as uh, the conservation has to go hand in hand so uh, you know they these have been picked up very well by uh, the international community and uh, they are all in praise for this kind of policy where uh, we have uh, you know on the one hand development and the other hand conservation going together now if i am to draw inference of whatever i have said and whatever i mean to say i would say that uh, wildlife conservation is for the mankind you know we need to have for uh, us to exist the man the human being to exist as well as the development uh, which should happen is also for the mankind and especially because we are from a privileged uh, strata of society we live in cities we live in urban areas we are privy to a number of uh, fruits of economic development we have roads we have other infrastructures we have hospitals we have our uh, power supply but the same is not uh, applicable for all the people who are living in the rural areas and uh, they are no less a model as far as the economic benefit the fruits of economic benefits which are to be given so you know if we have to think about them as well so we need to have the infrastructure in place which will help the rural population you know to uh, get mainstream into the indian economic development and also to gain the fruits of a development and uh, you must all appreciate that this is uh, an aspirational india this is a india who, who aspires to be a superpower who aspires to be a big economy so uh, that aspirational india should not be uh, limited to the urban uh, india only it should be for the entire country and uh, just like urban areas semi urban areas you know the village and rural areas must also grow together uh, along with the country so what i feel uh, at the end of the day is that development is necessary is absolute necessary for india to grow to for for all the, the entire population 1.33 uh, uh, billion population to actually get eke out the best uh, fruits of development and uh, then uh, the conservation is also an imperative so we need to balance both development is a necessity and conservation is also an imperative so we need to develop a synergy for the good of the mankind so this is all i have to say and i will be very happy to listen to savya sachi ji and my uh, friend sandeep who is on the other side of the line so thank you thank you gentlemen thank you mr <laughs> you uh, you given us a, a very very uh, a wonderful overview of what's going on i think it was particularly heartening to know that uh india's forest cover has grown uh, in spite of the uh the large amount of urbanization um our our uh, our policies have adapted and uh, there are challenges uh, but uh, i think uh, uh, you know the we are on the right track uh, and as you rightly said that uh, development has to be balanced with conservation and that's a very fine balancing act and you know i guess we have to learn as we go and and go as we learn <laughs> so um but on that note uh, i think we'll come back to you i have a few questions uh for you uh but um uh, <clears throat> but before that i'd like to uh, ask dr tiwari uh, to kindly uh, uh, you know make your remarks uh, and would you like to make a presentation dr tiwari then i can I would, absolutely i would like to make a presentation because oh. uh, i feel that would be a good way of what adg sir sure. said few of the things what he said you can see sure. for yourself how that has happened in the ground and yes. uh, in fact the way he he presented the entire picture of how the economic growth have happened and how we have been uh, how how the 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 you know 
our environment ministry dealing with it how we have been able to you know increase our forest cover so all that uh, i mean he has very beautifully explained so i really don't need to uh, go into that so i'll just stay we go to the presentation and uh, is my screen visible gentlemen yeah so uh, can you see the presentation now yes we can yeah so we Please thought uh, you know yeah so I thought is uh, as the adg sir said is is very critical that uh, you know on one hand we are we are aspiring to have an you know aspirational gdp growth of 9 to 10% or maybe a 5 trillion economy but also the challenge of uh, you know economic development on one hand but how do we balance it with the wildlife concerns so i thought let uh, no let me try and explain that a bit which uh, is you know giving uh, elephant as in focal species and see how we have been coming it uh, in india and our neighboring countries just a uh, you know snapshot that these elephants in asia are found in 13 countries in southeast and south asia and if you can see for yourself india has the largest population of about 30000 odd sharing its population with nepal bhutan bangladesh and myanmar uh, and also asia has about 15000 odd captive elephants now the major concern which it is uh, has highlighted has been with, with with increasing human population with increasing development and lead and aspiration the entire pressure has been on the forest and the habitat uh, which and and that's not only in india but throughout asia and, and and other wildlife areas that you look at habitat loss and fragmentation and degradation has been one of the major causes of uh, wildlife concerns across asia and the globe and and with the increased pressure uh, on the forest and the fragmentation there has been increased wildlife conflict uh, just look vis a vis uh, elephants the other pressures have been the poaching and illegal trade largely in the southeast asia and extirpation of small population of countries like vietnam which had about 1500 odd elephants to now as low as 100 elephants or cambodia or Uh, or Sabah, Malaysia, which are, but I'm today going to talk only on the habitat loss, uh, human elephant conflict, and the factors that has been responsible for that. And if you look at uh, most of the wildlife areas, especially elephant areas across this range of countries, these are also the areas that has high human population, uh, uh, which is increasing at rate of about 0.5 to 1.5 percent every year. and a study has been done way back in 2003 by peter limberg and his team we saw that out of about 500000 square kilometer of uh, area available for elephants only 50 to 51% of the area are can be considered as wild you know that can support elephants what we call as wild lands in this thing and the rest all 50% are all small chunk of forests which form part of the habitat but practically speaking only 50% of them are large enough to hold uh, the asian elephant population and out of those 50% less than 16% of them are legally protected so you see that this elephants uh, all the other wildlife have been you know uh, squeezed to in such pocketed forests surrounded by humanity all around and what has been the consequence as uh, adj has said human deaths Have, you know increased over the years throughout asia about 650 600 650 human deaths are reported every year just because of uh, elephants then they are dead due to leopard attack uh, you know snake uh, kill uh, bites or, or or tiger at, attack or many other animals attack and a large chunk of this human uh, death to elephants have been in india uh, about 450 to 500 odd elephant uh, human death every year If you look at the elephants death roughly about 400 odd elephants death in Asia and a large chunk of them has been in Sri Lanka about 50% of them reported from Sri Lanka India on average about 90 to 100 I mean over the years it has increased but if you look at the last 20 year average is about 80 to 90 odd elephants and in last 5 uh, to 7 years the number have gone to almost 100 odd elephants dying in any cases it has been a cases of retaliation where the elephants have been poisoned electrocuted 
intentionally or accidentally due to you know sagging of lines there have been gunshot injuries there have been explosives used across the globe and apart from the human death and elephant death there have been almost around 5 lakhs families impacted because the property has been damaged the crop land has been damaged and an average about a million hectare of crop land is degraded uh, is you know uh, by by the elephants in india every year so what's the solution on one hand there has been an decrease of the uh, the habitat which was available for elephants and they are getting fragmented and on the other hand there has been an increase in the conflict scenario so the best possible solution that i mean one of the best possible solution is the available habitat that is there for wildlife if connectivity can be provided so that the animal gets larger area for the movement and for this and there were elephant forms an essential component of land use management and just to give you in this uh, map for example this is the brt um, tiger reserve and this satmangalam and you can see for yourself the caldos are generally li narrow linear patches connecting to viable habitat that is a corridor should connect something with something and not something with nothing because you know the is of issue of uh, the definition of corridors these are nowadays wherever the elephant movement happens people say it's a corridor but corridor is you need in mind that it has to connect one habitat with another habitat and not just going from one habitat and going for crop breeding or small uh, habitat and and constructing that as edige said we have been mapping the um, um, ministry of environment forest and climate change the state forest farm and wildlife trust of india had been looking at all this elephant habitat uh, and in way back in 2005 we came out with a publication right of passage uh, and we is the ministry and uh, uh, the state forest department and all of us were King came up with this publication way back in 2005. And then again, uh, all of us revisited these corridors after a decade and came up with a list of 101 corridors, minimum of 101 corridors. So there has been an increase in the number of corridors that shows that there have been increase in the level of fragmentation of this habitat. And on top of this, about seven to eight corridors are no, no more being used by elephants. They're going to increase. And there are a few more on the pipeline which are critically endangered. So that's what the scenario of the corridors are there. So the elephant corridors have been identified. Even the Wildlife Institute of India, the ministry has identified the tiger corridors in these countries. And now we need to work at a landscape level of how do we work towards protecting these corridors. And just next two, three slides, I'll give you a, the, a picture of the health of corridors across the country. We try to look at how, uh, with the decrease in the forest, how has been the increase in the level of fragmentation and the corridor. And you can see, you see an inverse relation. That is, as the forest cover keeps on decreasing, there has been an increase in the level of fragmentation and hence the number of corridors. And you can see for yourself, there is one corridor for every 150 square kilometer in places like North Bengal to about one corridor for every 1,500 odd square kilometer up to six like northeast india or southern india and you can if you see the graph itself these are the places where the forest covers are decaying and the level of fragmentation are increasing and these are also the places where most of the human elephant conflicts are, are, are reported uh, among the highest public conflict areas have been uh, assam and Odisha and tamil nadu uh, and and then followed by you know west Bengal and karnataka so this gives a very great picture of what the status how the fragmentation of habitat increases conflict in the landscape. We tried to look at the health of these corridors and trying to see what was the picture in 2005 and what's the picture now. We found that these corridors have become more longer and less wider. That shows the pressure that is there on the habitat and these connectivities and the level of fragmentation that is happening. So the corridors are becoming longer and becoming less wider. We also try to look at the human settlements, and you can see only one fifth of the corridor identified are free of settlements. So they are human settlements varying in number in each of these remaining corridors. This has one, almost one third of the corridors have some sort of encroachments happening. Almost two third of the corridors have agricultural land, a part of them passes to agricultural land. 
12 percent of the corridors have mining and boulder so when i'm putting all these things it it's it gives you an idea of that the level of difficulties that the managers who are working in the field whether the state forest department or the ministry or the conservation officer mm -hmm. working the level of difficulty all of them faces to secure and protect these corridors because of the diverse land use in these corridors and as i said with without the legal protection to these corridors this work becomes more difficult and on top of this you also have linear infrastructures and we, what we saw was almost two thirds of the corridors has state highways or national highways passing to them almost one fourth of the corridor had a railway line passing to them and almost 11 percent of the corridors had irrigation canal passing to them and especially with the cementing of the irrigation canal i mean earlier it was surface now later on this have been both the surfaces have been segmented and that creates further impediment to the movement of animal and the result you can see for yourself since 1987 the country has lost about 327 elephants till date just been knocked down by the moving trains and on the right hand side you can see the statistics of where this all the happening the irrigation canal some of them remarkable like rengali canal in the northern urissa landscape or the subarnarekha canal in the south wing of jharkhand and urissa landscape where you know Earlier, when this land, uh, so canals were made, they were with mud surface. The animals were negotiating, accessing water, moving. But with the cementing of the surfaces, this has become a major impediment. On top of this, sagging of power lines, and 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 unfortunately, in spite of all this problem, there has initially there has been lot lack of coordination between various linear agencies and the department responsible, and that and especially at the ground level, that that you know that has created further hurdles in trying to implement uh, you know, strong mitigation measures. But realizing the fact that this linear infrastructure, as Sir said, is important for the economic growth and the uh, aspiration of our country and the government, we need to have this linear infrastructure. But the challenge and what we are today discussing is how do we balance and harmonize the economic development or the growth that we are talking about and the environmental concerns that we have. So, and uh, having said that, I strongly believe that um, when the various uh, development, linear development projects are being implemented, if there's larger coordination between these agencies and, the, and, and, and looking at what the threats are on the forest, then I think many of these things can be easily mitigated. And if you can look for yourself, what are the impacts of this linear infrastructure leading to habitat fragmentation, degradation, uh, wildlife movements are impacted, uh, you know, I mean, and in certain cases with uh, obstruction to movement, there is, could be cases of genetic isolation, there have been wildlife mortality or injury. Uh, in that, in fact, along the railway, uh, along the linear infrastructure, look at the behavior of this animal, that has also drastically changes where the animals are on the road, constantly looking for vehicles and other things that freeze them uh, with food material being passed there. They're trying to have easy access to the thing. So the larger concentration of the animals on the along these linear infrastructures. And the institutions have also opened up certain areas that was earlier inaccessible. And hence, all the issues of uh, you know uh, illegal activities happening there, uh, social impacts that's happening because of them. So all those things are there. And, and, and when we are planning this, we need to keep this in of how do we work towards mitigating each and every of this. So we need to strike a balance. And, and when we are creating this infrastructure, is we're just not looking at the small section that's happening. But as Sir said, we need to look at the landscape planning and seeing that when a linear infrastructures are being planned, how it impacts the biodiversity, how it impacts the ecological services that is rendered by that um, landscape, and how do we prevent them? And they are, as I said, they are, I mean, the government of India is coming up with robust policies and guidelines of how do we try and prevent them, check them, and issue a mechanism that, you, that we have linear infrastructure, but we have linear infrastructure, keeping in mind the robust uh, passage plan in these areas, and, and trying to see uh, if you can avoid having uh, this linear infrastructure in certain critical areas, forest or connectivity, trying to see if this could be realigned, even if it means you know uh, building some extra uh, kilometers, 
and if nothing happens how do we work towards preparing and mitigation plan so there is minimum impact on the animal over the overall biodiversity of this area and and to add this i strongly believe that not only we need to have a very comprehensive environmental impact assessment but probably with the environmental impact assessment we also need to bring in social impact assessment of how this linear infrastructures are impacting the habitat impacting the flora and fauna impacting the migration of the animal and also how is impacting the life of the people in this landscape unfortunately in few cases we find that the ei is are not done properly uh, with and thought that probably it's going to facilitate linear infrastructure but i strongly believe that probably with a stronger eia assessment you are better placed to understand what the threat could be because of the linear infrastructures and you are better placed to plan the mitigation measure whether it's realigning them or preparing a mitigation plan and once you understand what the thing then i think is rather than rushing to to implement is very important to spend time in your drawing on your drawing board talking to the ecologists the foresters the biologists land planners and trying to see how do we design this entire thing in a way that there is a minimum impact on the thing and once you design those mitigation measures and after being implemented we need to monitor and see how well they are working are the animals adapting to this if it is working well well how do we scale up and if it is not working well then what do we need to further strengthen and work on that and there have been really good examples in india and in asia where such smart infrastructures are being built which has really help the 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 you know the entire wildlife movement in there and has minimized the impact and and it's very very critical that you know rather than trying to implement this mitigation measures when the structures are done is good if you look at them and include in the dpr inception stage i know it may cost few percentage more compared to the normal cost but it drastically in you know reduces the impact on the wildlife i mean i can give n number of example let's talk about rengali canal for example in odisha where it was irrigation department created this canal and without looking at how it's going to impact the animals and the results have been that the entire landscape had become so fragmented it has opened up certain areas where it was not being done and the human wildlife conflict increased drastically and after about two decades The, then we started planning of creating ramps and bridges on that which really worked so if it would have been included in the very in initial stage the cost would have been much less to do that but the impact on the animals would have been much less and you can see for your example of the diagram on the left hand side is an underpass that has been um, made on nh uh, 54e which is passing through the lomding area in assam uh, and uh, is large in elephant area or in malaysia such viaducts have been made which facilitate animal movement um and and as very critical that when you making this uh, in um, plans the mitigation measures whether is underpasses or overpasses or culverts and other things it is very very under, important to understand the focal species or the species that is found in the landscape and form and uh, plan the thing in a way that the structures are apt enough for the animal and the, as uh, um, you know with the support from the ministry the wildlife minister of india has drafted the eco friendly uh, you know infrastructure guidelines and the design protocols and you can see for yourself with the change with the you know depending on the species found you design what should be the height and width of those underpasses or the overpasses and they have given for a wide range of species what would should be the design of those underpasses and i'll give you one or two example for example this you can see is national highway 152 passing through the manush national park and this is being used by and many other species uh, of animals very recently in the radhaji national park in the state of uttarakhand there are three corridors here one is the chila motichi corridor here the second is the tin pani corridor here and one further not is the kansa barkot corridor and through all of them this national highway 72 passes through it very recently at the uh, 
three flyovers uh, for vehicle and underpasses for animals have been made. One is the Chilamuti Shur corridor, which is 0.9 kilometer, and this is the flyover that has been made, which passes like this in the forest area. So there are two of them, and the underneath underpasses that has been created. This is re reasonably new, only about two months old. Um, when they got operational, now the department is trying to put in more vegetation here, and the animals have already started using it. So we need to have such designs in place uh, to facilitate movement. Uh, very recently, two weeks back, I was in Karnataka, where the Highway 209 is being expanded, and that passes to BRT and Satyamangalam, and it also passes to the two corridors area. So. Uh, the National Highway Authority had really come out with a good uh, plan, uh, suggesting where the culvert should be, suggesting where the underpasses should be, and along with the forest official, we totally surveyed this area and we, uh, you know, we, we, we redesigned a bit of where the underpasses should be, where the culvert should be coming in, and about and and since they have realigned it to an habitat area where a flyover coming in. So it's basically, you know, how in, um, the forest department, how the conservation organization, how the ecologists join hand with the linear agencies and trying to guide them to see that what are the areas where the animals are used, what species of animals are used, and what sort of structures could be built in those places. If those things can be done, then the linear agencies are slowly opening up. They are realizing the fact that they also have responsibility to maintaining in the ecological balance of the country, but also realizing the fact that in case if they are not taking the concerns in the fact that are litigations happening, there are delays happening and increasing the cost of the project. So rather than getting into all those issues, if this can be done at the initial stage, then the work becomes more hassle free, more reasonable and responsible, and both the ecological aspects are taken care of and the developmental needs are built in. I'll give one example before I move in. Is This is Dalma Wildlife Sanctuary in Jharkhand. And this is the Subarnarikha Canal that passes through it. And see how beautifully after, you know, uh, I mean, just few years back, they have created this Uber Pass for, for uh, elephants and, uh, and other wildlife. And this is how it looks like. This is the canal passing through, they have inserted, and this whole area is so they have made about 100 meter wide uh, uh, overpasses here and the and elephants and the species are using it very you know uh, you know efficiently and that's what is need to be so you really don't need to bring in rocket science but look at what's the ecological requirement of that area what are the animals using how it's going to impact and then design it and as adg has said the ministry of environment and forest has come with a notification that all linear infrastructure passing to PAs or buffer zones or eco-sensitive zones need to have a wildlife passage plan. And that is again a great uh, you know, initiative to show that the wildlife connectivities are maintained in this area. Coming to a second aspect of uh, you know elephants or other wildlife being knocked down by the moving trains, we try to look at why are this happening. And there are four major reasons, you know. One is the landscape attribute of curves and embankments and visibility issues along the track. There's a second issue of speed of the train or elevation tracks, tunneling. The ecological reason on certain season, the animal have to cross the track to move to use the other side of the habitat, either to access agricultural land or water bodies or food in that thing, or the linear infrastructure passes through the train line passes through wildlife corridors and uh, and migration paths or at times food waste are dumped near the railway track in the forest and hence the animals getting attracted to other things and with i mean along with the indian railways the state forest department we have looked at various landscape and the rays that you can i mean the orange marks that you can see you can see for yourself most of the region most of the landscape where this elephant mortality are happening due to train heat, the reason remains the same. And I'll just use two, three slides to show you how it works. With the stiff embankments, when the elephants is, when the train is approaching, it gets trapped. So when you have such, uh, you know, when you cut down those in, embankments, and when there's train, elephant gets an opportunity to move out. And this again is a very simple initiative that needs to be implemented. Or when you have 
depends on an elevated tax, you need to have a ramp on both sides. And give an example, this is the Palagat area in the Kambutu, uh, in the Kerala Kambutu, uh, Tamil Nadu part. See how beautifully they have created this ramp. So whenever there is a train coming and elephants on the track, they can use it to move. Or when there is elevated track and they are underpasses it, you need to develop this and design this underpasses in a, looking at animals that are present in there, using the guidelines to see what should be the height width and the open text. So it's very critical that not only the design, but also to look at uh, the exact dimension that you need to have so that the animal uses them. Also probably increasing the visibility of these animals on the curves, cleaning the vegetation so that the animal and the driver would get a clear vision uh, and sees that. You need to signpost such uh, uh, railway tracks and define the important curves, and define the important accident prone areas. And here, for example, this is the Palagad area between the uh, Palagad and Kambuto section where such signboards have been done. Similar things have been put in Assam or in Rajaji National Park to alert the time uh, local pilots that they are entering into a critical area where there are animal movements and there could be accidents. So, so just to caution them and be extra cautious moving through this time. Need to sensitize the local pilots because, you know, it's not that they are fixed local pilots going at a track. They keep on changing, so you need to sensitize them about do's and don'ts when they're passing through such critical areas. And what should we do when they see an elephant or other thing in and around the track? And how and what are the precautions that they need to take? The Ministry of Environment follows the State Forest Department are working with the Indian Railways to, to identify those critical stages and bring in speed restriction. And such speed restriction has been brought in certain sections. And in fact, if you look at railways, they have two set of timetables. One set of timetable that me and you users know when the trains can go in. But with the local palace and the station master, they have a second set of uh, you know timetable which says between pole number this to pole number that is an important wildlife area or is an action prone area, and this should be your speed of train. So it's very critical to, to sensitize uh, every yeah. layer of uh, people responsible while doing that. Uh, at times, you know, there are certain landscapes where elephants are using it just to raid crops or not feed it. So you fence off certain areas and, and open up areas which are used for migration, for corridors, for wildlife movement, so that all your 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 initiatives, your whether it's patrolling it, putting in sensors, you can use in this area and and fencing of the area. So for example, old railway tracks have been used in many areas to do that. And this is the oldest one that has been done in Posita Chakan and is working really well. And here, this has drastically decreased conflict in the nearby agriculture land and channelizing a little move through dedicated corridors and migration paths in those areas. You can't fence off all areas. So there have been certain areas which are critical high accent on areas. There they have been patrolling team working with, the, from, uh, with members from the railways with members from the State Forest Department, with a few of the conservation organizations who are working there. For example, Wildlife Trust of India has been working in Rajaji or in Palkat area or in Assam, and where they have been jointly pet uh, patrolling the critical stages. And there are certain critical stages where we can bring in science technologies to, to monitor these areas, and probably using infra -res, uh, you know, sensors uh, that can be used. The ministry is financing the seismic sensors in Rajaji National Park with Wildlife Institute of India and CSI uh, piloting it and trying to see if this could be used uh, to detect animal and alert the local pilots and the guards uh, and uh, to, to alert them and their elephants around using various cameras to detect animal and alert the thing. So basically, you know, it's, 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 it's a great uh, opportunity for youth working on technology to come up with such plans uh, co collaborate with the ministry and the state forest department to see and test these sensors to alert divers and local pilots across the landscape and 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 probably avoid the accidents. I'll give you one or two examples from a neighboring country. For example, in Bangladesh, they are coming up with a new railway line of 103 kilometers from Chittagong Hills to Kota, and this passes through three uh, wildlife sanctuaries and national parks. 
So what they have done is since it's the new line coming in, they have looked at the ecological uh, requirement of this area, the wildlife movement in this area, and have come with a plan where they are putting in overpasses and underpasses in high, uh, you know, elephant migration routes and corridors, fencing off certain section of the things. So there is an uh, Asian Development Bank uh, funded project. So they have hired consultant and have really come out with a good plan uh, uh, in sensor technology to detect animal movement along the things. And if it is really implemented well, so we expect that the rate of accidents in these areas could be much, much less uh, in this area. One more example that I would like to discuss was a railway line that was supposed to pass uh, in Nepal is, is the East West railway line. And, and this is the Pasa Wildlife Sanctuary. This is the Royal Chitwan Park. And in India, you have the Valmiki Tiger. So this alignment was designed in a way that it passes to the southern bank of um, Royal Chitwan Park and Pasa. And if this would have been planned, then the entire connectivity of tiger and elephant population and other wildlife between Parsa, uh, Chitwan uh, to Valmik would have been cut off. And this Royal uh, uh, Chitwan being UNESCO site, so they were concerned raised by the various agencies, they were concerned raised by the ministry. And later on, an alignment was planned. And now an alignment goes north of the Royal Chitwan Park. And this has helped to minimize the impact. So it's basically, you know, how linear agencies, how the conservation organizations, how the, uh, you know, uh, people who are concerned uh, with the entire forestry aspect, how can all come together and plan in a way that could minimize the impact of this linear infrastructure? I mean, all of us want to have, you know, economic development. All of us want to have a good infrastructure but I also strongly believe that if you are able to understand what would be the impact of this linear infrastructure and plan a mitigation measures, then I think we can really come out with such smart infrastructure which can help in the development process, but also drastically minimize its impact on the wildlife and both ecological aspect and the development aspect uh, are looked at. And this is one guide, uh, you know, guidelines, eco-friendly just to mitigate impact of linear infrastructure and wildlife. This was prepared by a wildlife institute of India with support from the Ministry of Environment Force. And that's a fabulous guidelines giving real good dimension of what are the things that you should be looking at when you're planning linear infrastructure through wildlife areas, what should be the dimension of this area. And similarly, there are a few other guidelines available uh, which could be used to, to, to you know, plan uh, linear infrastructures along the wildlife areas. So in nutshell, what I'm is if we are able to plan well, undertake a proper assessment of, of the impact and plan mitigation measures, then I think we can create a win-win situation where the ecological need and the development need can be taken care of. I'll take probably five, seven more minutes to look, go and look at the wildlife corridors and the elephant corridors Mass ADGS says the elephant corridors are not legally protected. Forget about the elephant corridors, even the elephant reserves are not legally protected. And it's very important uh, is how, you know, do we bring in and accord more legal protection to these corridors? As uh, ADGS has said, the tiger's corridors have certain level of protection, but unfortunately, the elephant corridors are not. And I believe there have been discussion going on that in probably the next amendment, if this could be brought in. And because of this, without uh, with no legal protection of the corridors, with changing in the land use pattern across the uh, you know, country, almost seven corridors have, have been impaired. And the second most other problem that you see is most of these corridors are not demarcated in the ground. So you don't know where there's a click. I mean, for a uh, researcher, for a conservationist, for, you know, planners they know exactly what it is but how do we demarket them in the ground so that each and every people agencies know that these are critical areas that needs to be protected so it's very important to demarket these corridors in the corridor sensitize local through such uh, signages and also work with the media because they play a very important role in educating the locals in educating the developmental agencies 
and other involved. Important to, to incorporate these uh, corridors in the, uh, with the conservation plan in the working plan and the management plan of, of, the, of the territorial or the wildlife protected area. Uh, in fact, the TCPs of the Tiger area do have a uh, corridor plan, but probably to, uh, as I uh, said, we, we, since we want to do it, we, we should be doing a landscape level planning. So it's not only the protected area, but even the territorial area, they both should talk to each other and plan of, uh, and plan and see that the corridors securement plans are in place. And also the fact that all the corridors that has been identified, whether the state tiger corridor, the elephant corridors and others, the state needs to recognize them and notify <coughs> them that all the stakeholders, whether the linear agency, the mining agency, the other industries know that these are the particular areas which are critical and needs to be protected when and taken into concern when they are undertaking any activities in this area. And then probably use the various provisions of the Wildlife Protection Act, the Environmental Protection Act, the Tribal Council Sixth Seasonal Area Act to see how do we protect and secure these corridors. And I'll just share a few examples of how the corridors have been secured across the landscape. Wildlife Trust of India works with the Ministry of Environment and Forest, the Project Elephant, the State Forest Department and others to protect and secure these corridors. And over the last two decades, while working on these things, we have devised four broad strategies. One strategy is certain corridors where the lands are available, people are ready to give up the land, we purchase the land in this area. In case if they are human beings and if they voluntarily agree to move out because of the high conflict, we ensure to provide right packages and plans to ensure that they move out voluntarily and, and lead a good life at an alternate place. We work with the community and trying to protect the land through easement or bilateral benefit sharing models. We have been working with the government and the agencies working as a bridge between the government and, 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 and the uh, community to secure corridors. And we have been also using the public securement model where we work with the various uh, conservation organizations across the country, uh, sensitizing the people, adopting the corridors. And I'll give you one or two examples to show how it's been done. One major problem is about 101 minimum corridors that we have in the country. There are certain corridors where there are a lot of people or organizations who are keeping an eye, but there are a few other corridors where there's hardly any attention. So we had thought of creating a system where, you know, eyes on the corridors. So we came up with this concept of green corridor champions, which are basically a community based local organizations who are all individuals uh, who are active in this area. So we uh, engage with them, we train them, and they are used to keep an eye on the corridor, look land use changes, looking at the animal uses in these corridors, uh, working to sensitize people, working to work with the various agencies who are there, so that in case if there's anything being planned that could deter or could hinder animal movement, that comes in the notice of the State Forest Department or the Ministry, all of us working, so that measures can be taken they interact with the various agencies to sensitize them of the criticality of the area. And, and most important is they create that pride factor with the people that this is the area which we are helping to facilitate animal. And so that's one thing that we have been doing. The second is the land purchase model and one corridor that we have secured in Kerala is this corridor, uh, which connects Brahmagiri with uh, Vainad and then to Nagarholi, where we purchase land, about uh, 37 acres of land, 37 people were voluntarily rehabilitated from um, the corridor to other area of their choice. Uh, this area had a high conflict area and this entire thing was done voluntarily. It took us almost 11 years to get the thing done. And you can see for yourself how the type of houses these people have been lived and the type of houses that we prepared. And this is the area that had been secured. Although we, we practically technically secured 37 acres of land, but the land that they were physically occupying were about 100 odd acres. So all these people, the yellow chunks that you see have been secured and this entire corridor is now being secured. And the secured land has been handed over to the state forest department and the entire secured land has been notified as a part of the Wainad Wildlife Sanctuary or the Wainad and the Wainad North Forest Department. And last year we came out with a report which the ADG sir very kindly uh, released it on the World Elephant Day. There have been many such examples. For example, the Karnataka government uh, secured a corridor in Bandipur, 
and this is you can see this is the gorge this is the human settlement and this small area was left to animal movement and the, so uh, with support from the project elephant ministry of environment forest and carbon uh, climate the karnataka forest department secured this land and now this is being used by elephants very um, successfully there's another corridor same landscape in the brt mm hills landscape and you can see, for example, how the Bandi, uh, Mysore town and, and Kolagal town has expanded. And a small area was left. And if this would have been lost, the entire connectivity between PRT and MMS would have been drawn. So while after Stuff India purchased this land and then handed over to the state forest department, and now this has been incorporated as part of the MM Hills. And the last example, I, I mean, there were many such examples in Rajaji and other places where the state forest department, the ministries and conservation officers have been joined hand to secure corridors. This is the last example that I'm giving is in Garo Hills, Meghalaya, where we are working to secure corridors, but then we realize that it's not only the corridors, but we need to bring with community land, almost 90% of the land being owned by the community. We thought, how do we work on a system to, con to provide connectivity between Palfakram and Nokrek no National Park? And we know this whole area as the Garo Green Spine. So for last two decades, we have been working with the State Forest Department, the Garo Hills Autonomous District Council being a six settled area. And about 3,500 hectares of land has been set aside by the community and has been notified as the village reserve forest, which is a level of protection uh, under the Garo Hills District Forest Act 1958. And two corridors have been secured. One is this connectivity between Balfakram, Siju, Tiruvak, which is this. This is the village and this is the village the forest the dark green that you can see has been secured and then the second is between Riwak to imangri this entire area of radigindam has been notified with 475 hectares of area and now we are working to secure the connectivity between balfakram and bagmara and also trying to see that how do we create a buffer of two kilometers in around nokrek national park and 3500 hectares have been secured and we are aiming to secure at least 10,000 hectares so that entire wildlife movement between uh, Nokrek National Park and Balfakan National Park is secured. And that's uh, easy said than done. You know, it involves a lot of discussion with the community, working on the micro plans, helping in them livelihood activities, helping them in education facilities, helping them to ease their life with uh, being uh, located in remote areas, whether it's helping uh, them, you know, improving. Uh, in commuting, structure like hanging bridges, minimizing slash and burn cultivation, and getting into terrace cultivation, or showing uh, you know Jhum fellow land, which has been declared as village as a forest for wildlife protection. So, in nutshells, these are the small uh, you know initiative that has been undertaken for securing the elephant corridors across the country. But what I have been say, uh, want to say is. If you look at uh, the overall initiatives, if the linear agencies and the people who have been working for protecting the uh, forest cover, the state forest government, the ministry, the vision organization, if we plan well, then probably a large impact of this linear infrastructure can be minimized on wildlife areas and we can have economic development as well as keeping in and the forest and the wildlife connectivity intact. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tiwari, for that uh, very, very detailed and uh, excellent presentation. Um, I think it was particularly heartening to note that uh, in Garo Hills, uh, for example, in Meghalaya, which is a, which is a six schedule area, you've managed to uh, use, the, uh, use the existing laws in the uh, six schedule uh, in the Garo Hills Autonomous District Council to secure some land. Um, I must flag here that in our experience, sometimes in uh, it is a, it is great that it has happened in Garo Hills, but in many areas, in six schedule areas, uh, it remains a challenge how to secure land, you know, for because land getting land is a huge uh, deal. Um, uh, your your comments on that, uh, uh, Mr. Das Gupta. Uh, one, that is number one. And number two, I want to draw both your attention to a much broader and futuristic idea that you had laid out. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Tiwari also alluded to this. That is the landscape-based uh, uh, landscape, uh, planning approach 
to how, how do you secure you know to have holistic planning and uh, Dr. talked about more emphasis on planning um, we have eias when we have big projects but um, if you have uh, have that landscape based approach probably right. the eias would be much more extensive needs much more study much more depth and dimension um, and that would kind of i think uh, make maybe in some cases projects go a bit slower the mega projects um, i would like to go back to mr dasgupta at this point and ask your point of view on where do you see um, the landscape approach moving forward how do you see it at what pace do you see it because that seems to be like an imperative coming out and on a micro question which is in six schedule areas are you seeing problems or is it is it quite smooth sailing in terms of um, you know securing land for corridors or, or or for that matter any other purpose related to environment and conservation yeah am i audible sir yes, yes you sir. are sir. okay yeah see uh, having uh, you know including this uh, land which are beyond the uh, protected area uh, regime it is not a easy task and it's a difficult proposition and that is why you know to get the uh, legal uh, teeth to the elephant corridors are becoming difficult because elephant corridors uh, are not like uh, tiger corridors or for other animals you know this is a huge area and i can give you an example of uh, west bengal uh, the mayur jharna elephant reserve and uh, it entails huge chunk of uh, uh, non forest area maybe 80% of the area is non forest the zone of influence and uh, these are all revenue land and private land and being farmed by you know the uh, subsistence farmer and uh, you know to have them within the domain of uh, the process is a very difficult proposition but uh, you know uh, in spite of that uh, i would say that you know the process of landscape based management is perhaps the way out or solution to uh, the problems that we are facing now and uh, that will entail uh, the involvement of uh, not only forest department but also various other departments who are so called the stakeholders and uh, i firmly believe because uh, you know i also had the opportunity of working in tiger reserves uh, we have that concept of foundation uh, tiger foundations which we are propagating for uh, national park and sanctuaries also we finding this in the upcoming eco tourism guideline as well uh, empowering the local population through these foundations now while constituting and working for these foundations we had to have the uh, other stakeholder departments means the panchayat Uh, the rural development uh, you know the roadways and uh, so on and so forth they have all got to come together and uh, the plan itself that we used to prepare was holistic and uh, the contribution came from all these departments and also you know to the uh, people who formed a significant portion of the so called jfmc uh, force of west bengal so in that way it was successful but then again it's limited as far as its extent is concerned it was limited to sundarban tiger reserve that i saw but now that to take beyond the tiger reserve beyond or rather to the biosphere reserve the landscape of that sundarbans is a difficult proposition but i feel you know this is the only way out and we need to plan in such a manner so that we take all the stakeholder departments uh, you know the people in general and uh, the panchayat uh, with us uh, in order to move forward and uh, yes the same situation will be also uh, you know uh, having its own issues and problem in northeast uh, as sandeep was saying uh, he you know regarding meghalaya and other areas but one good thing that has come up in the northeast uh, which is a very heartening sign is uh, there's a new concept of protected area called community reserve and conservation reserve if you have heard about it and uh, these are actually the community participated protected area and uh, uh, you know this has come up in a very big manner in the northeast and uh, more than half of this kind of protected area uh, community reserve as well as conservation reserve 
are from uh, the northeast so the signs are very heartening and uh, you know because we have laid down the plan for landscape based management and uh, of obviously we have to have all the stakeholders with us and uh, in whatever manner you know there will be limitations there will be uh, you know uh, 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 hills to climb and we will climb and uh, we will see how we can how far we can go and uh, regarding another thing because most of the time we restrict our discussions within the country uh, because uh, you know all the policies laws and acts are related with the country but most of these animals especially sandeep was also mentioning about the elephant you know elephant they don't don't recognize uh, political boundaries you know they move to elephant moves to bangladesh they move to nepal they move to bhutan and i am uh, you know witness to the uh, the uh, you know the onslaught or the ravage that the moving elephant herd had caused uh, in a place called Karsiong in West Bengal due to a construction of a barrier a fence uh, between India and Nepal uh, by the side of the Mechi river if i remember correctly it's uh, tremendous you know that has caused a lot of human cry on ground in the west bengal side so we need to have this uh, landscape based management with the uh, uh, neighbors also the neighboring countries as well we have to come together you know and uh, we need to ensure that uh, you know the damage is minimum and uh, both the species survives the uh, elephas uh, maximus if i'm sandeep if i'm right yes, sir. Yes, sir. and the homo sapiens you know they have to exist together so that's my understanding yeah yeah thank you uh, mr das gupta i think i think that's very very apt because um, in fact you know this conversation is part of what we called the nadi series nadi is inspired by the idea that our waters actually do not follow political boundaries and waters shape the landscape uh, and waters shape the habitat and our rivers you know and uh, they also have uh, you know flow across boundaries without recognizing that they are man made boundaries and we have to listen to nature Uh, and it, we need to come together for uh, for uh, across countries uh, uh, to 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 work together towards this um, this uh, end. Uh, so we see a lot of convergence between this approach of the landscape approach to conservation and the basin level approach to managing our shared waters. You know, I think they are kind of the way out. Um, and thanks for pointing that out. You, I would like to let you know that. Uh, the nadi platform has enjoyed participation from across the borders it continues to engage uh, with uh, people across the borders and uh, your uh, your statements here make a lot of sense um dr tiwari some la some and we are almost running short of time but uh, maybe uh, one one recommendation you would say taking forward uh, on how do you take this landscape uh based um, you know approach moving forward from your point of view being on the field on so many areas see uh, as i said uh, when we talk about the landscape planning uh, we need to take into consideration uh, multiple focal species that we using in that and and when we talk about landscape planning we also to need to take about not only the animals that is there but also the human beings there. so as uh, you know as i did say said in the previous conversation that you know is very very critical that not to work in isolation and not to plan in isolation so the local communities who have been there uh, who have been protecting those landscape for generations how do we involve them use the traditional knowledge uh, involve them in the planning stage from the very initial stage and then probably do a planning so that it is not a top down approach on them but is a collaborative approach where every strata of the of the of the society are involved uh, in the planning process so there you know you, you develop the ownership of what you are planning and and implementing and that's what in short we've been trying to do in garuvils as well you know when we started working on the thing and when we just went with that narrow concept of working the corridors thing really didn't Worked for us well for a few years. Then, when we started looking at the entire landscape, trying to understand what the problem is. For example, I mean, uh, you, for example, have been there in Meghalaya for you know years. Garo is Meghalaya. Water was never an issue till about a decade back and all. 
now you see in west garo hills from at least two three months water is a great scarcity with so much coal mining and limestone mining then the entire simsan river if you look at in summer right. season this all black belt there the fish catches have decreased the water catchment areas have decreased so we have been trying to link with the life of the people and trying to see the increase in the conflict the drought scenarios there uh, you know he was trying not able to do lot of activities uh, the food security coming in so we have tried to say you have led your life now you need to also think of your children so how do we plan in a sustainable way that you also lead a good life here but you also pass on the baton to your next generation who are also going to benefit so that really concept has worked well we have tried to look at the the problem this people are feeling how can the livelihood be supported and then pl planning with them and trying to implement that so that in at a micro level where i went uh, for a landscape level planning type into it That's or say That's for great. example state like many states have you know started planning in a more large scale landscape level odisha for example they are working in a state level landscape planning planning at a circle level where the territorial division the wildlife divisions are working the right hand should know what the left hand are doing you, then only you can synchronize the activities there and that's what is very critical uh, in many other things areas that need to work on yeah right right yeah um we are almost at the end i i have to ask one question to mr Song das gupta before i go because i can't help myself not asking you this question which is that um we we all recognize there is a need for uh, you hi you highlighted community participation dr trivedi also atilide uh, you know highlighted community participation all that is very important um but finally when a mega project happens um such as a big linear infrastructure project happens and there are many in the in the pipeline uh, such as a dam or a huge bridge or a road uh do you think that we need more time for the eias or do you think we are having adequate planning process as we are now or do you think it needs much more study and insight as of now as of today uh, sabir sachi ji i think uh, this is the last question i will take because i have to move out for another yes. meeting okay yeah, this is the last one also yeah, yeah. Uh, and secondly i must say that uh, yes uh, i am not actually directly associated with the uh, you know the environment uh, issues the eia assessment so it is not good for me to comment right now okay. uh, but i must say that uh, as i was speaking in my uh, during my remarks that the government now believe uh, very strongly in the inclusive nature of development and uh, uh, there was there is still a concept of relocation of forest villages you must have heard about it yes. and uh, we have ensured that this villages relocation uh, does not happen involuntarily so uh, the government ensures that uh, the voluntary relocation happens the people are as less affected as they are number one number two the financial compensation package uh, which was drawn up uh, i think uh, uh, 10 15 10 12 years back is now being revised so that the compensation is adequate or at least uh, to increase to such an extent which reduces the burden of uh, these uh, forest dependent community to move out of forest uh, uh, voluntarily and relocate themselves outside so this is all i can assure you and we personal i mean the, the, the departmental staffs in the forest as well as the ministerial officials are absolutely sync with this idea that we cannot do any development without taking the people along with us whatever policies that we make now i trust uh, me it happens with the inclusion of the people we ensure that livelihood opportunities are provided for for all the peoples who are actually associated with the species be it terrestrial be it marine be it, be it even birds who come to the wetland area so we are there with the people whenever we make any kind of policy but as far as its effect uh, you know while uh, standardizing the protocol for the environment impact assessment i think uh, i'm very sorry that i'm not the right person to really comment on it uh, but that's it that, that's all i wanted to say regarding people's involvement in the development project yeah thank, thank you. you very much dasgupta and thank you dr yeah. trivedi tiwari for uh, you know 
uh, for uh, for uh, for your remarks and for your participation in this very important discussion. We we plan to take this forward and we look forward to being in touch with you. Um, wow. we, I'm sure our viewers would continue watching this and learn a lot from this experience. Thank you so much again. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir. Oh, 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 oh,